Welcome to Nachtwaffen Pilot with Penny Bradley. <clears throat> and today we are blessed with Joseph Powell. But before we talk, <clears throat> I have to do an obligatory rant. Okay, we're in the middle of April. We just passed tax day. I've been back on my show for three and a half months. And during this three and a half months, I have had now three people cancel on me at the last minute. This is unprofessional, cruel, unusual punishment. If you're going to take a time slot with me, have the decency to give me a week's notice. I'm blessed that Joseph Powell is willing to come in with no notice. Now, <clears throat> the most recent one has really pissed me off. This is a man who was only marginally related to the topic because he was researching Knights Templar. Now, if you go back through the history, the Knights Templar have been the people who have protect protected the Merovingian bloodline who are who is taken for these projects. So the man's name is Freddy Silva and he thinks that I'm a Nazi. <clears throat> Come on guys, I was kidnapped as a child and forced to serve with the Germans in space, who by the way are not Nazis anymore either. But because my show is called Nachtwaffen Pilot, he decided he didn't want to be affiliated with that. Sorry, guys, a pox on his house. So <clears throat> that may not be enough of a rant for, for Odin, but at the moment, it's what I'm going to do. Um, in my own usual terminology, this is seriously uncool to agree to take somebody's time and effort and then shit can it because you don't like the title of their show. When you sh I schedule three weeks in advance, he had plenty of time to research who I am and what I do. I research every person who interviews me. When I go on their show, I know who they are, what they're about, and what level I have to talk at for their audience. That's called being professional. So I may be in a fringe topic and my experience may not be what you want to hear about, but I'm campaigning for these black ops to stop kidnapping children. That's a hell of a lot higher goal than somebody that's sitting around bitching because they're not selling enough books. So, now, <clears throat> on with our show. Um, Joseph Powell and I have discussed that we're going to talk about how people get their memories back without paying a channeler. <laughs> there is a hell of a lot of people out there who are preying on our community. They're channelers, they're psychics, they're hypnotists that lead you with questions. They're, they're all charging lots of money. Now, some of them are actually honest, decent people, but the vast majority are not. And so we're going to talk today about if you're a real SSP veteran, how to get your memories back without paying one of these frauds. Okay. I know Joseph has a chat group with the 
most, well, I won't even say most, with some of the Montauk survivors, men and women. And they've been going through and comparing notes and sharing what they remember. And so since he's been so successful with that group, I think that makes him an expert. Welcome, Joseph. <laughs> Hello. It's nice to be on here again. Um, yeah, uh, most of the most of the ways that I've learned is well, first is coming across people, their faces um, that that are in this community tend to cause memory to surface, um, or they can talk about their experiences because we have joined experiences. A lot of people misunderstand that or they just want to say it's these are my memories. Well, if you're around other people, when those memories are taking place, those aren't just your memories. They're our memories. And there are some memories that we're not even a part of, but others are. And I've noticed there's a lot where I think you've covered it and others where they'll be like, oh, don't watch anybody else's stuff because then that might cloud your testimony and this and this and that but the reality is is that the more that I've talked to others that are in this community the more that they've activated my own memories and through that I get memories that I don't even have with them just with that specific altar um, so it normally starts out for me with seeing their faces and then artwork is another uh, portion in the community that activates memories as well um or photos of locations that we've been to like for montauk you know you see the radio radar tower that activates a lot of people from montauk you know because it's a traumatic situation and when you were being brought in there that was the first traumatic site you saw before stuff started getting really crazy um amongst other things you know um it's like your childhood photos when you share those with people, they can remember you. Um, that starts activating people's memories because you went through trauma with them as children. Um, and, you know, it's like, that's, that's where a lot of it starts off with is interaction. And interaction allows you to activate more of your memories. And granted, like with you, you've spoken before about how you can have, the, you can remember the same location, but not remember the same memories. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. And then there are screen memories like you've talked about. I recently came across uh, a screen memory and normally with screen memories, you don't have the emotions that you would have with them. You know, um, it feels for me, at least it feels kind of detached. Like, you're seeing it, but you're not really feeling it. And it's like, I had somebody that, that I, that I had talked to and, you know, they're, they're able to, like, they have a higher, you know, we all have higher selves and stuff like that. Uh -huh. And, you know, a lot of us. In well, the I don't, are, but well, <clears throat> I have a committee instead of a higher self. And my committee is the Council of Nine, but it's not the same as everybody else refers to when they say that. Mm. So. But it's, uh, you know, we, we do have people with higher selves that they do connect to, mm. and their higher selves can see things that we can't, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the people I work with do it for free. Um, I've come across one channeler but you know like like we discussed before that was it was done for free but it was like most of the stuff that they talked about were questions that i already had the answers to yeah i already knew about you know so it was like thank god i wasn't paying for it because that would have been a waste of money <laughs> yeah what i've seen is instead of actually seeing what we were in they're seeing it's almost like they're telepathically reading what we have in our minds. So if what we have in our mind is wrong, they're not going to see anything else. Mm -hmm. And it's been really frustrating for me 
to watch people that I know, I know they have no real memories because everything that comes out of their mouth came out of one of my videos. And they will go to a channeler who will confirm what's in their head from watching my videos. And then suddenly they're public and I have other people asking me, well, what do you think of so-and-so? And then I'm in the position of, if I disrespect this person, they're gonna be at the next conference I'm at. And I'm going to have to be face-to-face -face with this person who truly believes at this point that they're real. So, I make it a strong policy of I don't comment on the veracity of other people's stuff. You and I have talked privately. You know there are people out there that I consider to be stolen valor. Mm -hmm. And they are quite popular. But mm -hmm. at the same time, it's back to the situation of they had an idea, they went to a channeler and the channeler confirmed it because the channeler used telepathy instead of remote viewing. So. Yeah. Uh, and also another thing is um, names. Our alter's names, if you can get a hold of your alter's name, that activates more memories yeah. and it's because once you say your author's name they're there so they surface and the more you think about it the more those memories start to surface which is one of the one of the things that i've noticed as well um and as i've done work with people like personally when i when i remove the memory blocks on on people i've come across screen memories uh -huh. um i make it a big situation to have them look behind the curtain like what you said and i've yeah. noticed that 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 activates the real memories yeah and normally that, i can tell that because was, that was an important thing that i learned to do because the agent who activated my memories we shared this every Friday screen memory dream of being mer people in a kelp bed. And I was like, okay, it's just a dream until he said he shared the same memory. And at that point I'm going, oh shit, this is a cover memory. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I actually talked with this guy for three years after he activated my memories. So this was this was an ongoing relationship until the CIA killed him. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's it's been quite interesting to say the least. It's like um, when I am doing my work, I normally do it with my twin. And she's really strong tele telepathically. And I'm able to, as I remove the memory blocks, I'm able to remote view what these people are watching okay. and remembering. So, you know, I have her as a backup, mainly. I mean, she's there, not just as a backup. You know, we do it equally. Yeah. But she'll notice something that I may not. And I'll notice stuff that she may not. But when we're working with people, it, it kind of coincides. Um, she normally pulls out their, their names, their alter's names. Um, and it doesn't always work with everybody. Some, I mean, I will admit that there are some people you can give them their alter's names and it really doesn't do anything. You know, it's just like you can see a, a location for some people that might have been there and it doesn't do anything. You know, these are just a variety of different things that do that work, but not all of them, not everyone will work specifically for these individuals, you know. Yeah. Um, it, the one it's that a I toolbox that not every tool applies to every individual. Yeah, it, it, the only thing that I've seen that normally activates the majority of us is seeing childhood pictures or pictures of us when we were around the age that we served, say in space or other black ops projects. Um, 
because they normally try to keep us around the same age for some weird reason. You know, it's either we're growing up to a certain point or, you know, some of us, they'll let us get older than that. But it also depends on what project you're doing. Um, so that tends to freak people out. <laughs> I mean, it at least freaks me out, you know. Um, but yeah, mainly like childhood pictures, those those really do activate a lot of people in the community. Um, that's the majority of what I've used normally. Um, I don't know per se what all you've used around other people, but I know like when I saw your face in an interview, that activated some memories and I was like, I know this person. <laughs> And I'm like, I don't know where I know this person from, but I know this person, you know. Uh, everywhere and, I have ever lived and I've moved a lot, there has always been someone who would sit and stare at me uncomfortably. And usually they'll say, well, you look like my sister, you look like my cousin, you look like a, a teacher I had or something like that. But Knowing what I know now about the SSP, <clears throat> I have to wonder if there's more to it than that. Um, <clears throat> I also know that I have altars out there that are not in this body, and they are also doing things. Um, that's how Doris Neely knew me, mm -hmm. was I had an altar that worked in her office. So, you know, you have to, at this point, I would say there are lots of possibilities and you shouldn't just throw any out, of, out the window just because you don't remember them. But at the same time, you should be very careful that these are actually your memories and not a cover memory or where someone else is imposing theirs on you. Mm -hmm. well it's like like when I do work with people um to explain it like from my own point of view I try to go off of their memories and like I tell them you have to have your own memories mm -hmm. of a situation and then we can go and look into that situation yeah you know I don't I, I don't like where people try like you're saying guy like telling people what they remember you know yeah. I don't really like that I like for me when I'm working with somebody or we're just talking, whatever the situation, I may ask them questions about what they see. Yeah. You know, um, if we share memories, like when I'm talking with people and we share memories, they may have a memory of me and they'll mention something and I'll, what I can do is I can go into their mind. Normally it's my alter job. He goes into their mind and then it sorts their memories <laughs> like chronologically puts them in order with yeah. what they have. And I'm able to not only view it, but see it. I can see it from two different angles. If it's my memories that, and their own memories, I can see it from a third person view when I'm remote viewing what they're seeing. And I can also see it from my own personal view, you know, in first person. Um, so I find that to be an interesting situation. Well, I stopped doing counseling when my shoulder was ripped apart because I was in too much pain. And when I would enter the person's mind, they would feel my pain. And I felt that was unprofessional and uncool. But the approach that I was taking was deep listening I would give the person my total undivided attention for the time frame that we were working together and just hear what they said. And I would ask questions about what they told me. I wasn't getting into their head at all. I was just mm -hmm. listening. So it was a completely normal type of human experience except that most people never really listen to you mm -hmm. and for the people that have been 
SSP, Montauk, Super Soldiers, whatever. Yes, those are different categories, guys. They don't, some of us have been used in all of them, but most of the time they're different people. And so you're, you're in this position of everything you say is considered so insane by most people that they just click off and you've never been heard. And that was what I was doing with my counseling was I was listening to what they had to say. And for many of them, that was very healing just to have someone listen to them. But I wasn't doing anything intrusive. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, most of them, I don't remember what they told me. Um, because it wasn't my story, I released it. So I have not been telling other people's stories, by the way. That's mm -hmm. another thing that's uncool. So um, What's like I, did, I did form like an aggregate of what's the normal. And the normal range of possibilities. So when somebody comes up with something that's like physically impossible or completely out of the normal range for these programs, then I start to ask pointed questions. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And once in a while, I'll blurt out, well, they'll describe some sort of uniform and I'll blurt out, well, that's such and such. You know, that's, um, there was one couple that were talking about uniforms that looked like Air Force from, from World War II, American Air Force. And I said, well, that's, that's Kruger. I, I will do that, but I won't tell you what you did or who you served with without you giving me details to back it up first mm -hmm. it's um i find it to be the one thing i do find to be interesting is when i'm doing that if they have screen memories i can't see what they're seeing until we get past the screen memories which i find to be interesting that i've noticed for myself you know um i don't know what that's about per se. Um, most of the people that I've done work with, they normally can't connect with me um, on the same level. There are some people that can, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's certain individuals that can, and I feel them in my head while they feel me in their head. And yeah, <laughs> that's, we, that's always a fun situation. And I have so much shielding up. And there are some people who can simply walk in pew, like that. There's one man in particular who can walk in and he acts like he owns the joint and starts yelling at my, my guardian beings. And, and after a certain length of time, they will just group hug him <laughs> and then he calms down. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's um, it's it, it's fairly interesting, you know, because of the background I have, like starting to watch this all unfold, you know, um, especially with with these different ways of of my memories being activated. Um, I mean, I have done like I think four, maybe five actual regressions, um, but every I've regression done I've done, three. I've never been. Yeah, I've never been put under, you know. Um, I've always been coherent of my surroundings. I can come out of it at will without an issue. You know, I've never had people, um, you know, how they do like the, the thing back and forth and try to make you sleepy and shit like that. I've never had that done to me. Um, uh, I had that done when I was being taught self-hypnosis. 
I do use self-hypnosis. And when I do, the first thing I say is draw back the curtains on the screen memory, show me what really happened. And because I don't want even fiddle fart with with the screen memory. I want to know what really happened. See, with the screen memory I came across, I was having real memories and that I had two different altars. So it was kind of weird. I had memories of this one altar with with this crew. And then it went into a that altar got killed. And then I went into another altar that conjoined and knew that crew. <laughs> and when that that altar met that crew they were trying to get aboard their ship and they wouldn't let anybody aboard their ship and see what i remembered the screen memory was they we all decided we were going to go hunt down my uh, my evil altars right mm. yeah you know it's one of those hero complex <laughs> screen memories and um you know we were like oh yeah we're just gonna gonna leave the ship you're gonna hunt down your evil altars um guys um if you're listening to this your altars are you (laughs) yeah um well it's like some of our altars are in clones some of them aren't but it's like if you kill the body you know the soul shard and the actual soul, because normally the way that I recollect it is, and I think you've brought it up, it's your actual soul that's in that body, mm-hmm. you know, and then they activate the, the soul shard, the soul fragment, you know, mm-hmm. or the, the other altar, and right? And you, ex- your soul experiences it in a linear fashion where you have gone and lived that whole life, came back, lived another whole life, came back lived another whole life, came back. So even though they're in the same timeline, in the same time time frame, they're in different spaces. Some of them are in your body and some of them are inserted into clones. Mm -hmm. So this, this one, for the one I'm talking about, what happened was is they the group that I was working for on that original ship, they had me interact with this group because they recognized who I was. Okay. I had the same face as the other clone that they knew, that they killed, which freaked them out because they were like, what the hell is this? You know? (laughs) And uh, the screen memories happened because they took me in with them and they started putting... Re- erasing their memories and putting screen memories so that they would think that we were the good guys and the altar that was there didn't agree with it because i wasn't even a soldier on the ship i was a maintenance person and oh, which is funny. funny yeah and the maintenance so, people know how to run everything though and so i'm like watching this happen and i'm like this isn't right like even that clone was like this isn't right so they grabbed me and started erasing my memories and then put in these screen memories with them. And what had actually happened was is that we, we walked up to their ship. The one individual that, was, that took charge of the ship after he killed my other altar clone got basically ordered them to open up the door. And we got aboard. The person that was in charge, that was left in command, felt like the person was under some kind of mind control. Didn't know, but was like feeling that they were under some kind of mind control, but still opened the door. And when we got on the deck of the ship, which this wasn't part of the screen memory. Screen memory was we got on the ship and we were going to go hunt down our altars that were evil. (laughs) You know? Mm -hmm. Um, So, but... You know, it's like somebody that I that that I work with because I work with a few people and they were like, that doesn't sound right because they were there too. Yeah. So when I realized that, you know, we you know, she helped remove some of the screen memory and then all of a sudden the real memories flooded through. And it was like I was just sitting there like shocked, you know, because then I felt the emotions. I felt 
the pain of what really happened. And it was like, we walked up to the ship. I got them. They basically were fully invested in what was going on and they got the doors open. We went on and we basically took the ship over and then let Nachwaffen take over the ship. You know, uh, the original altar that they were working with, it was a slave ship and um, we had slaves aboard and it was, um, this is memory that I share with quite a few people. Um, but it's like, that was under house, what, what we found to be under house Shaw. They basically took our, they took our DNA, cloned us, and then they would have us go and sell slaves for technology. Mm. And we had the ship and I was the captain of this ship and that altar was brutal. He was brutal. Um, if well, you didn't yeah, obey orders. I served under was kind of brutal. Yeah, this one, this altar, if you didn't obey orders, he would torture you. And then when torturing failed, he would sell you to people that we were already selling slaves to. Of course, he would come and pick you back up. He'd give them a lot of time that they could have them. And if they didn't bring, if they didn't bring those people back, I had to go hunt them down. <laughs> because it was like the people that I was working for they didn't want anything to happen to those clones. Like they were there for a reason. I couldn't kill them, by the way. I was told that that is not going to happen. And because that altar was like, well, they're not being obedient. Why can't I just kill them? Because well, torturing isn't are, working. And they're like, we need to figure out another way. Property of not like and like the statement that a GI was in World War II was government agency and Uncle Sam owned his ass. So in Nachtwaffen, the military are owned by the faction. They are assets. You cannot just kill them. Yeah. So, Even so if they're a total incompetent, uncooperational, disobedient pain in the ass. You cannot just so, kill them. What, what was funny was, is that one of the other individuals that, you know, just became public, he was on that ship. And even though he was cloned, he was um, our navigator, which was interesting. Um, we didn't know too much about a lot of the other stuff. We just, we knew what our jobs were and that was it. Yeah, that's most and, of what I know out there is what my job was. And navigators are plugged into the computer. So they're mm -hmm. a security risk. So we are not allowed off the ship. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was interesting to see the first memories and he brought up certain things like how he remembered talking to me and pulling me out to the side and be like, hey, man, you need to stop doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. People are getting tired of it. You know, and I was like, I basically blew I him off. I have a pretty good and, idea who this person is. He's been on my show, hasn't he? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> He's a pretty good guy. And, and whenever he talks about what happened, he goes to the limit of what his memory is. And if you try to ask him any further, he just says, I don't remember. I'm not talking about it. And I have the utmost respect for that. But the first time that he did it, I just sat here with my jaw dropped open. <laughs> he, he has a lot of, of accurate memories of a lot of different things. Oh, yeah. I say. And it's, it's quite funny, though. So, like, it's like that I was able to working with, like, two, two individuals I mainly work with. They got me my altar's name mm -hmm. on that, on the first ship, which was Nicholas. And then we were able to, um, I was able to see different individuals that were on the ship. Uh, all of them were from house shop, <laughs> you know? Um, and I've been able to correlate them with 
my other altar that you served with and all the people that he knew before he joined Nakwath. Um, and that was Pindar, which is a separate, separate situation, right? Mm-hmm. But we were we were basically taken, cloned, and then put in that body and then sent to do these these missions. Um needless to say, they decided that they were going to take the ship over, right? And when they did, one of the individuals uh had walked up and shot me in the throat and as i was laying on the uh, on the deck of the ship at their feet bleeding to death (laughs) they were all deciding on what to do with me and they were like well we can't we don't want to put him in a cell they were like let's not put him in a cell because then he might come back somehow let's not try to regen him he's not going to work with us he's crazy he's gonna he's gonna torture us if he gets the chance and well, they said, I let's throw his ass. Up, I may have blown up your head, but at least I put you in regen. Yeah, no, they, they were like, they straight up were like, let's throw him out the airlock. That's painful. And they threw me out the airlock and took off. And I died. <laughs> and I'm sitting there bleeding. I'm like, trying to beg for my life. And they were just like, they just picked me up and took me where I needed to go. And that was it. You know, whenever um, you're not using psychic abilities, the fastest way to kill someone is to slice their throat. Especially if you're lo- using a laser blade, it will s- cauterize it. And the brain stays alive for up to 15 minutes, even with, because the blood and the oxygen in the blood is still there. So your brain stays alive until the oxygen's gone. So you're dead, but you still have consciousness, and it's it's just a really freaky feel. Mm-hmm. Yes, I've experienced it, people. That that the things that they do to us out there are beyond belief. They have region tanks. They can make you go through everything that they do to you. And then just bring you back like it never happened, except you have full memory of it. Yeah, and it it was quite interesting because I I know the people we were working for, they wrote my ass. And if I didn't do good, I got tortured. And I was a numbers guy when I was on that ship as a captain. Every number had to be in order. You know, everybody had to do their, their duty, no matter what, you know. And I understood why they took the ship, you know, but they thought they were just gonna get away. And, you know, they, they took off and they started doing whatever they were doing. And then they got met by Nachwaffen. A Nachwaffen ship came across them, you know, and they took them into some kind of hangar. Um, and it was, it was a pretty big ship from what I can recollect. And that altar that they met on that ship was called, his altar's name was Saul. And That's what? Can you spell that? Saul, it's S-A-U-L. Okay. And he was just a maintenance guy. I had memories. I had memories before of him, but they were really light, you know, and it was like, I remembered the uniform that you talked about, you know, the gray, the gray clothes. I remember that. And it was, it was quite interesting because. Um, That person that you mentioned, he was the one who originally brought that up and at that time I didn't remember it yet but afterwards I've seen myself wearing the grays interesting so yeah so so I mean that that was my altars that was my altars name from Nakawaf and on that ship was Saul I just want to clarify that um and it was weird because I had interaction with them only because they came I think it was like four of them came off the ship and it was like they were escaped slavers <laughs> who were slaves themselves, technically. Um, well, most of them are. Yeah. You know, and that and they, seems to be a common thread throughout the entire galaxy is that victims are turned into perps. Yeah. And it was it was quite interesting because I saw all four of them, didn't know who the hell they were, but when they saw me, they were like. <laughs> they were just like oh shit <laughs> and 
it freaked them out because I looked the same as Nicholas, but I wasn't Nicholas. And they were like, it's him, you know? Oh, yeah. And we spent a lot of time talking. You know, we would take them into the cafeteria. They would, we would sit and eat in the cafeteria and I would ask them because they would tell me, you know, they, they were like, you, at first they were freaked out. And then they finally kind of opened up because they realized that I didn't have the same mannerisms, you know? And they started telling me about Nicholas. And I'm like, well, who the hell is this person? You know, because Saul was under the impression there's a guy that's doing evil shit running around with his face. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, when I was first public, I would go into these, these counseling rooms and pe people would freak out just me sitting there because they had memories of me as their drill sergeant or as, as an assassin. And one woman has vivid memories of me as some sort of medical technician killing a doctor that was assigned to, to torture her to death and that I, I saved her life. And I'm like, I don't remember any of this shit. <laughs> yeah. But they have very vivid emotional responses to seeing me. So yeah, I know there's somebody out there with my face that that's, that's doing stuff. Yeah. It, it was just, it was, it, it's interesting to me because I was seeing the perspective, the, the perspective of Nicholas, my alter Nicholas, and then seeing the perspective of my alter Saul and his perspective of whoever the fuck this Nicholas guy was that had his face. And I'm feeling like the emotions on both ends and like how freaked out he is about this whole situation. And he just kept asking them questions and they were like, look, we don't want to talk about him, <laughs> you know? And at some point it's funny because the person that I'm talking about, he he even remembered, and I remembered as he was saying it, where they literally were sitting there, they're like, amongst the four of them, and I, I remember Saul overhearing them, and they were like, we can't get rid of this guy. And I remember them saying that. <laughs> you know, so yeah. I found that to be a, a funny situation, and that's, it's like... That's one of the problems, though, that people who are remembering this have, is dealing with they have more than one altar mm -hmm. it's difficult to wrap your head around altars in the first place but wrapping your head around is that it applies to you now i'll be honest if somebody is public and they're talking about the They've been in one of these programs and they're claiming they don't have altars. That's a big red flag for me. Now, some of these people out there claiming they don't have altars, I've watched them shift. So I know the real. One woman in particular has demanded that videos be taken offline because they showed her shifting and she maintains to this day she doesn't have altars. But I've watched her on camera shift into a sex slave kitten and flirt with someone that in her normal persona, she doesn't even give him two cents worth of time. Yeah. <clears throat> you watch a complete personality shift and there'll be an appearance shift that goes with it. Now, if you're not seeing that from a whistleblower, an SSP veteran, a super soldier, a Montauk person, they're not real. If they don't shift alters, they're not real. And I will just flat out say that <laughs> Because I'm tired of the wannabes and the LARPers and the pretends and the I watch too many videos. You know? 
I'm tired of dealing with people that think this is a game because it isn't. Yeah, I've, I've let two of my alters talk about my life so far. Because How did that go? The first one didn't go so well. <laughs> yeah. uh, she did not like what he had to say. Um, but he has his own personality and his own likes and dislikes and things. Um, the second one, that, that first one was John. Um, John's, John can be a prick. Yeah. He's, but he's my worse. More of, <laughs> yeah. John is more of my moral compass alter. Like he actually has some morals, <laughs> uh, okay. some heavy standards from what I can recollect um, and from what I've seen. Um, but my alter, Jimmy, I've let him come out. Um, and talk to talk to my wife and that was recent and um, you know we just talked to her explained different things you know because she wanted to find out who he was and I can tell it kind of freaks her out but it's like I've started to learn about another altar that I had a name of and I didn't really understand things that I was being um, activated in the here and now uh, when I was like it was roughly about 14 years ago. So when I was younger, uh, they literally activated my altar, which is Jonah. And uh, he has a mission name that he calls himself Craig. So when he's on missions, he calls himself Craig. That's one of his mission names. And they were activating me and I would just leave my house at night, be gone the whole night, literally. And... Um, I would come home and my wife was like, where did you go? And I was like, I went out with friends. And that would be him talking. And I could somewhat see it, you know, and now that I've gotten more memories back of it, I can see a lot more of it. And he'd be like, I went out with friends. And she'd be like, oh, so you went out with so-and-so and so-and-so? And he'd be like, no. She's like, well, what friends are you going out with? And John had to step in because he's always been there. And he was like, John stepped in and said, don't ask, like basically told her, don't fucking ask where I'm going. It's none of your fucking business. You keep your mouth shut in the discussion. Um, I have the 13 by 13 by 13 cubic array that Stuart Swerdlow talks about in his book. And I have been blue. It'll be 21 years next month. He has probably seen most of those altars. I don't share memory with most of them. Um, they're out of the 2000 or so. I only share memory with 32 of them that have are in stages of reintegration and then a dozen more that I have partial memory from. So if it's one of the others, I don't even know. I just have missing time. Mm -hmm. uh, last year on my show, about, it was, oh, it was November through about April. So not this past winter, but the winter before. I was shifting like a Rolodex. And I had lots of missing time. And I had to watch the recordings of my, my show just to know what I'd said. And I had to know what I'd said because the public holds me accountable. And Lou has been living with this, this whole 21 years. <laughs> and uh, I guess I can mention his name. Eric Hecker had paid for a trip for Lou and I to come to his house in Alaska so that I could see his documents so he wouldn't have to put them online because he didn't want his social security number and his personal identification on his DD-214 to be public, which is reasonable because that's what they use to steal your money. So um, we were there and his lady and Lou one day were sitting in the living room talking about what it was like to live with someone with alters that didn't share memory. And 
up to that point, I had thought it was just my problem. And that was probably the hardest day of the whole trip was listening to that and realizing how hard it is for our partners. And then I see women who think that, and sometimes men who think that we're wonderful, perfect partners because they never get bored with us. <laughs> I'm glad you laughed. <laughs> well, it was like when they activated that altar, he was active. So I would black out, he would surface. Uh -huh. I had a, me and my wife had a friend that lived next door. And for some reason, that altar was infatuated with that. And I didn't know any of this shit, which was kind of freaky to me until recently when she started talking about this. But I was basically, this altar was meeting up with her um, at night as well, separate from going on missions. Um, and then when she wasn't around, he would go over and sleep with her. And they had like this whole thing going on for like a year. And I knew nothing about it. That's the crazy part. I'm like, she started bringing them. I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> you know, because most of my memories have been, you know, my wife being like pissed off at me. And I'm like, what the fuck are you pissed off at me for? You know, 14 years. And she's like off and on been mad at me, yelling at me for some awkward reason. And I'm like, I don't understand why I'm in this conversation. <laughs> like, and now things, now that she started to elaborate on things, things are starting to make sense. You know, it makes yeah. sense why she was mad at certain things. And like, it was like, that altar made plans with her to run off. Just run off. And I'm like. <laughs> that would have been frustrating. The body wanting well, what, to be in different places, different days. Well, no. And it's like she knocked on, on the door one day and was like, when she was headed off where she was going to state, she was moving to him. She was like, are you going to drive me? And I was like, uh, No. <laughs> you know so that's the memory i had i was just like uh no i'm not going to drive you and i was like well maybe i'll have my wife drive and she was pissed and i didn't understand i was like okay well that's what's going to happen because i'm not going anywhere i don't feel like driving anywhere and you know my altar the memories i've gotten back you know and i haven't gotten full memories yet but they were making deals basically just to dip out and she told my wife everything when my wife drove her to the, to the state she was moving to. She literally told my wife everything. And I'm like, I don't even know what I would do if I was in that situation. You know, that yeah. freaked me out. And, you know, I've only gotten bits and pieces. I haven't gotten full memory of the situation either. So I'm like, I have these bits and pieces and it's, it's weird, you know? Um, I have a dumb question that's only slightly off topic. Have you gotten to this stage yet where you think your partner's a handler and you want to kill him? I don't. I know that that altar, when she kept asking questions about them, what he was doing when he was going to go on missions, he basically was going to put her down. And that's when John stepped in and was like, mind your business, shut your mouth, don't ask any more questions. That's why John said what he said, because that altar was going to hurt her. That and, was that was one of the things that kept kept coming up when I was counseling people, was they would go along and re reach a certain stage where that they felt they were just about to make a breakthrough, and they decided their partner was a handler because, from the partner's point of view, they just wanted their spouse back. <laughs> And so the combination, the person I was counseling would get so freaked out that they would think it was okay to murder their partner because that's a handler. Well, I know that she is because there's certain things that have taken place, uh, which I'm not going to discuss publicly, but okay. things add up where there's some handler situation, but it's like, I don't think she can really handle me very well. They didn't pick a very good handler, to be honest. 
<clears throat> yeah, um, I think that's something that people need to know, it, though, is that this is a stage that we all seem to go through where we think our partner is a handler. And for some reason, we think it's okay to kill them because they're a handler. Well, I, I mean, this, I this is it's... a very dangerous stage that people go through. And oh. if you know your partner is dealing with alters and dealing with memories of black ops, you need to watch for this or I don't know how I can, I lost count of how many people I talked down from killing their spouse. Because this is a very dangerous thing that's out there. And with you doing counseling with people now, if they have a spouse, they need to be reminded this person loves you anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, even if they have an altar that's a handler, the person you're married to doesn't know that. Yeah. You know, you have to give them some grace. Mm -hmm. Oh, Jimmy, Jimmy told her, Jimmy told her flat out the conversation he had with her that she was a handler. And she was like, what? He was like, you're a handler. You have an altar. That's a handler. <laughs> it's flat out. But, but at I've the never same, wanted, at I've the never same wanted... time, you're doing memory counseling with people. This is yeah. going to come up. Mm -hmm. Anybody who is doing counseling with people from the, from the Black Ops needs to know this is going to come up. This is, mm -hmm. okay, back a decade ago when the super soldiers were coming out and some of the Montauk guys, that was the biggest problem they had was they would reach a certain point of remembering and they would go nuts and kill their family and then kill themselves when they realized what they'd done. This, it was the biggest problem in our community. And that's one of the things that, that I'm going to name names, Ileana and I, with some other people who are not public, we took the effort to say, it's okay to not be perfect. It's okay to have altars. It's okay to have done things in your altars that are not right. Just don't kill anybody here. Mm -hmm. And so we changed it from 10 years ago. It was a community of over testosterone, chest thumping men who were in competition to be the biggest alpha. And so when they reached this point of they were going to kill their family because Omega programming and, and their spouse was a handler, they had nobody to go to. And so we saw this as a major problem, we women in the group. And some of the men decided to support us, but this was how we changed the culture of the community to being one of group support rather than individual competition. Now you'll still see individuals in the community that are still stuck in that prior culture because they, they are so proud of being alpha males. They are so proud of their high testosterone. They'll post photographs of themselves with guns. They do all sorts of things because they're still stuck in that competition mode. But that's been the major accomplishment of the last decade is changing it from competition to group support. What you're doing now would not have been possible a decade ago. Yeah. Well, it's, it's like, um, so it's like that, that altar that she dealt with, 
uh, originally, um, Jonah. Uh, from what I from what I've gotten working with other people, and it was like even some other people that I normally don't work with, like brought information through. Um, Black Manta is the organ is the group that he's with. It's called Black Manta, and it's a navy. It's a black ops navy group. Um, and it's weird to explain because the missions that he went on when they activated me when I was younger were torture missions. So they would come and either pick me up at the house or I would get on my vehicle and drive off. And then basically I would drive to whatever destination there was. And then I would get in the vehicle. I would get normally a van and then I would change in the van. And we normally had black, black uniforms, black outfits. Um, we would change into them. And I remember as, as I've gotten some of these memories back from that point, I remember getting in one of the white bands and complaining. Like I, I remember Jonah complaining. He's like, yeah, my bitch wife won't stop asking questions. And one of the other people with their altar was like, you want us to go handle that? And he was like, no. You know, so that's a very real situation. Mm-hmm. You know, you have people that have altars and they will go and kill people mm-hmm. if they know too much. It doesn't even have to be your altar, you know. Um, so that's another thing that I've had to deal with is knowing that 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 was a situation that almost occurred. You know, and I, I remember like we had somebody and we were torturing them and they asked my name. And that's how that name came up. Um. Craig, the name Craig, his mission name, because one of the people he was torturing, they were torturing from information. He was like, what's your name? He's like, my name's Craig. You, you just froze up <laughs> you know? for a minute there. And, oh, sorry. It, it's, he was, yeah, it's becoming an every show thing. Yeah, Craig when he called himself Craig, he's like, basically the person he was torturing, he said, you asked what his name was. And he said, my name's Craig because he can sense the intent from that individual. Cause that's my Delta. Jonah is my Delta assassin altar. And normally he's in some kind of black uniform. Um, normally he's on a base, an underwater base in the here and now um, I've connected to him and been an, an observer and he's just motionless, emotionless, just walks around this area, this, you know, the ground is made of, it's like a catwalk ground, but there's like some chairs that were in the room and he was just walking around and I'm like, you know, that's where I got Black Manta because I was like, who, who are you working for? What, who are you with? What are you doing? Like I was talking to this altar and this altar said Black Manta or Black Manta, but that's what I got. And I know that there's like that weird Marvel bullshit or DC or whatever the fuck it is that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. Okay. You know, like these dudes, they, they work for a Nordic group that oversees them. And what they're doing is, is they're altering, they're opening up portals, bringing other animals in, other sea life through, taking that and mixing that DNA with human DNA. Well, I haven't gotten the official names of any of the programs that I'm in. Yeah. Um, And I think that's on purpose so that I can't identify them. I, uh, I know some of my altars names most of them are involved with uh, ongoing operations on Earth. Mm-hmm. And if I out those, I will be killed. And so will anyone I talk to. And I have been contacted by agents who asked me, do you remember this company name? Do you remember this, this target? Do you remember this town? 
you know, and yeah, I remember them, but I'm not going to tell you I do, <laughs> you know, and it, I'm sitting there freaking out, wondering how close am I to being killed <laughs> while I'm talking to somebody on, on Facebook Messenger. Mm -hmm. And yes, people, these do, these folks do contact you on social media. Um, I have what, 1130 friends approximately on Facebook. And out of them, I'd say probably 50 of them are agents, at least. You know, that's something else that folks need to understand is SSP assets have altars and every one of those ssp asset has at least one altar that's an agent and i've had people freak at me you have to you have to block so and so so and so and so and so because they're agents well sorry they're ssp assets and yes ssp assets while we have altars, we also have altars that are agents of various groups. And have, some of them, some of them are spy agencies, and some of them are military, and some of them are criminal. So we have, you have to just you have to just deal with it. We have altars that watch altars that are watching altars. Yeah. that are watching you <laughs> like yeah <laughs> it's 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 quite intriguing to be honest coming yeah, across the, this the stuff layers of it you know you get to where it's like what the fuck i'm just gonna talk <laughs> i think what helps a lot is when you when you talk to these alters and you tell them that they're working for evil groups and some of them are like no no i'm not it's like yes you are um, it's like do you remember you know normally when i talk to people you know, I'm like, when I get a hold of their altar, which doesn't happen all the time, but when I do, I'm like, do you remember they raped you as a kid? Yeah. They took you and raped you. Do you think that's good? Does that sound good to you? And then they'll think about it. And man, do these groups that have these factions, they hate me. They fucking hate me because I'm turning their agents. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I have altars. They think they're male. And I'm like, how the hell does that work when you're in a female body? I mean, and, and I look in my closet and go, what are they wearing? Because they're not storing it here. <laughs> it's just. I know I have a female altar. I haven't really gotten its name. Um, it freaks me out because, you know, like I'll be like, I know that it's surfaced a few times in my life where like I'll be laying in my bed with my wife and I'll turn around and then like, you know, we'll be sleeping together and then like I'll brush my hair back and I'm like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I'm like, uh-uh. <laughs> uh-uh. <laughs> and, I, um, I don't have a problem with the altar thinking it's male. I'm just wondering how it maintains that illusion in, yeah. in its own mind. <laughs> well, I have a little bit of memories. They're like fuzzy, but it's like that altar was in a female body and it believed it was a female. So it's just weird. And then like seeing what I looked like as a female was weird too. <laughs> I know what I would look like as a male. I have a little brother. <laughs> <laughs> My little brother is almost as big as you are. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, guys, Joseph and I have met each other real world. I know I know his size relative to me. So <clears throat> yeah. But that was that was awkward coming across, to be honest that was an awkward situation that I'm starting to understand a little. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to understand it, but it's like, I, I get it. Um, um, 
in my family. Okay. I've talked about that I'm bloodline. I'm a Merovingian. Well, the Stuart family. These are the royals of Britain going back a thousand years. They go back to Robert the Bruce and beyond. They have a genetic issue that causes a disease called congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And with this disease, if both parents carry the bad gene, each child has a one in four chance of having that disease. Now, it has to come from both of them. So you have this kid that's a boy that has this disease. And the version that my kids have, they'll just, you'll think you have a normal boy and it'll die by six, six, seven, eight weeks. Now they have treatment for it now. So my kids have grown up. But if you have a child with this disease and it's a girl, it will be born intersex, which is it started off to be a girl and the disease turns it in, tries to turn it into the into a boy. And by the time it's born, it may or may not look male. So how this is as inbred as this family is. There are whole lines where, where three out of four kids died because of this disease. The ones that lived were extra smart because that's the side effect of that gene. If you only have one of the bad genes, you're extra smart. You have two of them, you die. It's a hell of a way to run a family, right? <laughs> so <clears throat> my youngest was one of those born in between. And he's now close to 40 years old. And so I've spent the last, well, my oldest is over 45. So I've li lived this whole time with this understanding that there's a lot more to sexuality than just male and female. And now having the memory of alters that think they're the opposite gender, but are still in this physical body. I'm sitting here with this understanding that a lot of the current political situation regarding gender, I believe it has a basis in SSP in what they're doing to us. And I'm not gonna say it's right or wrong. I'm just gonna say, I'm not judging these people. Okay, there are issues that go beyond what religion teaches. When you start having situations where you're mind fracturing people into, <clears throat> into altars and then convincing an altar that it's the opposite gender, And then you have this person who's trying to reintegrate all of this stuff because they know they're broken and they have this, this thing that won't go away. And you have people who practice worship of the old gods where that if you don't kill the firstborn, you have to raise it as the opposite gender. Can you really blame those kids if they're confused when they get to adulthood? Now, sometimes I believe at this point that they may have several things going on. 
some of them physical, some of them psychological, and some of them are because of what these programs are fucking doing to them. And I'm sure as hell not going to sit here and make their life harder. So my child who was born in between has chosen to live his life as a man. And he's married to a very nice woman. And I really love her a lot. And I'm not giving them a hard time either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. you know. I don't know. For, for me, like for myself, it just freaks me out because that's not who I am, you know, <laughs> as Joseph. So it's been quite awkward to have that, you know, crop up a little bit from past tense and current tense and to understand what it was. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, beyond that, though, you know, it's like it's just it's awkward to me when and it's like all my memories that are real they come with like when i see pictures of people's faces it comes with pain in my head especially if i know them there's uh, always pain yeah, in my head uh, you and i talk and and i will tell you something and you'll go oh my god i have a headache yeah <laughs> that's like half the time we talk it you you end up with a headache from it yeah, you know, sometimes I got to push past it. Um, normally the headache, it's one of my child alters that was tortured, electrocuted. So if he, if I remembered, he's supposed to step in and hurt me to stop me so he doesn't get hurt. Uh, you know, so, and I've, I've learned that he's just scared, you know, and he still is active and he still does stuff like that. Normally I try to hug him. You know, I haven't done it in a while, but normally I'll sit there and I'll just think of hugging him and calming him down and then it'll, it'll subside and stop. Um, or if I just change should I, subject. Should I remind you of that whenever you tell me you have a headache? <laughs> uh, no, it's like now it's just in a way I kind of accept it because it pings me, you know, so I can know for a fact that yes, I do know you, you know, um, or yes, this memory is real because I'm getting a headache. You know what I mean? Um, either way though you know it's like that's just that's what I have to go through you know it's like sometimes you know it's like when I was talking to this one individual they were like oh you know this person agreed so I'm going to show you a photo but doesn't say it and shows me the photo and I'm like ah ah <laughs> like you know and this was a separate person um, and when he when that person did that like, I was like, whoa, man, like, you just can't do that. <laughs> like, you gotta let me know before you show me, you know, because it, it's, it's not just pain that that comes with, it comes with memories as well. Mm. You know, um, the one person that they showed me is in public, but I remember them, I remember raping them, you know, as Jimmy. Um, so that freaked me out, you know? So it's like, for some reason, a lot of Montauk stuff has been coming up. And the more that I talk about it, the more people remember me and get drawn to me, which creeps me the shit. Like, it creeps me out. I'm like, I'll talk about a certain altar, and then these people will come along and be like, yes, we remember you. And I'm like, yikes, you know? <laughs> yeah, people tell me, well, I remember you. And I'm like, oh, shit, do I want to hear what you remember me doing? <laughs> Yeah, it, but it's like everybody that's done that to me, I do remember them because I see their face and I'm like, oh, shit, you know, and if they show me a childhood photo, I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of people that remember me that I don't remember them at all. And I'm not, I'm going to assume that it's alters that have not come up for reintegration yet. Mm-hmm. And because I'm a generation older than most of you guys, the process that was used on me was a lot harsher and I have more alters. Mm -hmm. so well, I, I remember when I first started talking to you, I remember I talked about the list of the 10 names. 
Yeah. I have more than 10 names with tender. I have more than 10 altars at this point of names. Like I have a list of names now and it's longer than 10. And I have these slight memories. They're still kind of fuzzy of that was a daily situation. They would take, I would show up at school and then they would have me write down more names. <laughs> Great. And I'm like, you know, I'm like, you know, it's wild because it's like, I think they did it so I would be attached to those names. It would make it easier to create the altar's name and the activation code because I picked it out personally. Um, but they, there are names that I didn't pick. I don't remember picking. They were picked for me. Um, most of my altars actually have the same name. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea how the agency took them apart. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, I had one altar that um, I called her Starbuck, not because that was her name, but because she had the attitude of Starbuck in Battlestar Galactica, the eat, drink, and be merry because tom tomorrow we're going to die. <laughs> you know, um, that was her attitude. And, uh, you know, those who know me real world are going, I can't believe you, Miss Sirius, ever had an altar that was like that. But yeah, I did. And, uh, that was actually very useful because she was used to uh, she was used to collect intel from bar owners. She would, <laughs> she would come in and seduce the bar owner into uh, accepting contraband for sale and uh, once the deal was made, then they were in trouble for breaking the law, and then they were trapped. They had to provide intel from that point forward, in exchange for which they got Johnny Walker Red. You know, so I was, I, it was bad girl stuff. And, uh, but that was my job. And it was in Nachtwaffen. Mm -hmm. and that altar probably would never have made it in any other position. <laughs> so <clears throat> you get to where you wonder, how. Um, what's the matter? Uh, sorry, I just got a text. Hold on one second. I'm listening. But uh, then I have the one that was on... Mars, and they called her Valkyrie, which now I know there was another altar that was a Valkyrie, so I don't know why they called the main one that, but I know the name of the one that was a Valkyrie. Um, But most of them, I don't, most of them were just called Penny. Mm -hmm. I think even the one I, that served with you was called Penny. Wasn't she? Um, I'm still not 100% sure, but I know that that altar likes to call you Penelope. Ah. Or Penelope, as you call it. Okay. But I'm not, but I'm not 100%. You know, I just know that when he surfaced, in that one interview, that's what he called you. Of course, I don't know. He is a pretty good, strong telepath. He could have gotten that name somehow. Penelope I have no idea. is what the name is in both German and Greek. So, yeah, it's very possible. Uh, but on, on Mars, I was Penelope Velkirum. Yeah. It, like, I, I know... 
I, on Mars, I know that I had that altar that was named Joseph, which is German for Joseph. Mm. So I know that when they took me, you know, um, that was the altar that, that basically, I feel like it was like me when I was a kid and they took me and then they trained me from that point, you know. So I don't know if that was necessarily an altar or if that was just me and they tortured the shit out of me or, you know, just trained me and I just had a whole life with them. You know, I remember that altar. I think it's an altar though, if I recall, um, the way that, that it feels as it is an altar, but like they created it, you know, <sighs> um, but I know that altar was the one who was a Mars defense force at first. And then he moved up in the ranks and then he became somebody who would torture people for information. And then he went from that to, you know, the, tor on... the torturing people for information. That's what, what an intuitive, in, in, intuitive empath does in Solar Warden. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just just for the folks out there who always wondered what a certain whistleblower actually did in his service. And it's it's kind of weird because it's like after he broke down and he was arrested, um, you know, he was tortured in the same manner that he tortured people. Mm -hmm. I remember him going to this uh, this this small city. And he was able to go around just the average colony, colony and he would do what there would already be people doing. And I've met somebody else who does it, which they would be basically be going through people's minds as they were walking around to find dissidents. And I remember him doing it for free, for fun, for his off time. He would just stand in a crowd and look for dissidents. And pick them out and have them arrested. Hey, I just put it on my Facebook profile. I'm a dissident. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's what he did. And he, he took his job very serious until he broke down. Um, and then after that, it was, they torture him. And then they moved him to a different, uh, a different thing. Like he ended up going off the planet. He went to another planet. He wiped out, like didn't wipe them out, but killed enough of this group of, of beings that they submitted hmm. um and when he showed up it was like the guy that he, he was on this platform and there was another another soldier that was there and when i showed up he you know called me commander and i talked to him and i'm like i'm like what well, you know i had him debrief me on what was going on and then he debriefed me and i was like well why don't we just kill them why are we wasting time and he was like, what? And I was like, order, order it. <laughs> you know? And he went over to a panel. Yeah, and that's, gave the order. that sounds like the altar of yours that I know. Yeah. Uh, but this one was Joseph. And he was just like, kill them. He basically felt we kill enough of them, they will submit. You know? And that's what they did. And he watched from afar as soldiers on the ground wiped out a lot of them and he didn't stop until and this went on for a while he didn't stop until they submitted and begged for mercy yeah, and well, um, people people who have been tortured as children often have no mercy yeah he um it's weird because it's like he knew what it felt to be tortured he knew what it felt to be a torturer and he you know he um he had a certain individual that he cared about, which was twin to him at the time. He didn't know that until now. But, you know, that, that person that he was twin to, he tried to get back to her. So that's the only way he knew to get back is to complete whatever the mission he was sent on. And that mission was to get them to submit, you know. So that was, that was his ordeal. And it was quite interesting watching memories of that, where he came back and found out that, you know, it wasn't going to work out. 
you know, he was thinking about escaping and he realized that it, you know, this situation changed. And then he ended up going into Nachwaffen after that. He just said, fuck it. Um, and, you know, they had him on a ship with other individuals that he tortured because anytime those individuals would try to escape, he knew where they were going to escape, how they were going to escape because he knew them. He was in their mind, you know. Well, uh, my understanding from my experience in Nakvapen is that escape is not possible. Um, we had chips implanted as part of the Neuralink process where that if we thought about Earth, if we thought about escape, if we thought about what an asshole the boss was, that, that small bombs would go off, which was very much like what I did to you. That's where mm -hmm. I got the idea for it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, uh, some of these guys have told me, oh, yeah, we we took a Nachtwaffen ship. And I'm like, not if you were chipped like I was, you wouldn't. It's not possible. You don't even own your clothes or your shoes. And, mm -hmm. and you're good. You have a bomb in your head. How are you going to take control of anything? I recall there those the individuals that I, that I tortured. They were able to escape, but they never got very far. Yeah. And they always sent me after them. And when they'd send me after them, I would find them, and they fucking hate. Them. To the point they put me on a ship with them. <laughs> and they would Maybe torture me if I did not find them fast enough. So I don't know what the situation with that was. I don't know. I do know that what you're saying is accurate. They do chip people in their heads. They do put many bombs in people's heads. Yeah. I've heard that not only I just in Nachwaffen, but like the... the um, Planetary Corporations does the, that too. Eliana yeah, they, has talked about it with my altered John, how I talked about that early on in my memories, the original memories I had with John, the slaves that were there that were on that, that planet um, mm -hmm. that he went to, the, the series calling that I was on, they had chips in their heads. I watched one of them try to speak up and he got his head exploded right in front of me. Mm -hmm. After I watched a, that other soldier get shot right next to me. Yep. You know, so. So I, I, have that awareness i have had the seizure and migraine from them warning me i was heading the wrong way and i hear these people talking about well we took a ship and we did blah 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 and i'm like how mm -hmm. if you're chipped into the ship to be able to navigate the damn thing then you're chipped with a bomb. How the hell did you steal the ship? Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm like, this is impossible. And yet they're, they're absolutely dead certain that they did it. And I'm like, how? And, and when I've talked to him, I, that, and it comes up, it's like, how? This I really want to know because my experience and that they don't the, mesh. The one I remember, they the those individuals they took a small ship. They didn't take the actual ship. Oh, and okay. it was like one of the transport craft. You know, okay. um, even, that's what I recollect. Even so, but, uh, you know, if you're chipped into the ship's computer, it has rules. The ship yeah. knows who it belongs to. It knows who's authorized. At this point, I don't know specifically how they did it. I just have memories of them doing it. I have memories of getting killed, trying to track them. 
you know, it's, I don't know, but it's, you know, those, it's like with um, the well, one I was two, originally talking two about. Two of the ones that, that I know of that are telling a similar story were on the ship with us whenever I blew up your head. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm like, okay, we're all on this ship together. And, and I'm like, I have no idea how they stole a ship. Hmm. Well, the ones, the, the ones that served on that ship, I don't remember very much dissidents at all. Hmm. Ever. To my recollection. <laughs> other than other than you blowing my head up, that was about the only dissidents I I have recollection of at this point. Okay. <laughs> Most of the people that were on that ship follow orders. Well, we have five to ten minutes left, so um, if I know you have a page or a group on Facebook now. You want to mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit? Uh, sure, sure, yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a fractal weapons group. Uh, it's on Facebook. I call it fractal weapons. Um, and it's a place where people that are real can come and, you know, I try to post people's videos that I remember. And, you know, if they choose to talk or not, that's up to them. Um, and I post things that are going on from time to time and people can post on there, you know, that their own stuff that they remember, uh, but it's an open, an open page. So it's not just like closed, closed down to only certain people, you know? Um, so it is an open page and sometimes we get crazies that come in there and I remove them. <laughs> I've had to remove, it's, it's weird. It's like every time I add three people, I have to remove one of them. <laughs> that's about par yeah no. um and you know i try to keep it as as on point of whatever we're talking about or discussing as i can um but beyond that i mean that's just that's what i'm doing right now and i'm trying to right now i'm posting more montauk stuff because it's what what's been coming up because I've been bringing Jimmy, Jimmy's memories have been surfacing a lot more and I'm starting to get a lot of those. So it's like with that, I'm learning, you know, what kind of fighting styles we used, um, what kind of clothing we were wearing. Um, and it's like, it's not just me either. There's other people that we've realized and put this together. Uh, like Matt, Matt and me have, you know, remembered a mission and we started remembering the uniforms and he brought it up and he was like, it looks like this. And I was like, okay. And then I had to try to find something. And then we were able to track it down. And I did a Photoshop of it. And that triggered a lot of people. Um, yeah. Um, one of those discussions, I had to remind folks that I was a generation ahead of, of y'all. And that if I remembered something different, that it didn't mean that they were wrong. Just mm -hmm. that I was there 20, 30 years ahead of you. Well, I, I mean, I found it interesting. Um, it made sense, you know. Uh, What's well, like the uniforms, they transition because of the group that, that was being worked with, mm -hmm. you know. So it's like after after I and the rest of the people after we took over that base and changed a bunch of stuff um, and removed a lot of the threats. Um, we, my alter Jimmy, he worked close with basically the uh, Air Force Joint Chiefs of Staff. Okay. And I've looked up photos of all of them to current and I recognize every single one of them. And I remember seeing them as I was looking at photos I remember talking to them in the office I don't they remember any of those in Montauk in my time yeah they so. they didn't show up there because we didn't allow anybody to show up there they had to contact us um I had a tv in my room and in my headquarters or not not the headquarters sorry let me rephrase that in the office that I sat in and they would contact me and they would come up on the TV and I would talk to them just like I'm talking to you now. Mm -hmm. And I 
you know, there's memories that others remember of talking to other people that are prominent. <laughs> um, and me getting my alter Jimmy getting in arguments with the, with that, with a certain individual. Um, and uh, they made threats and it didn't work out for them. <laughs> But yeah, it's it's quite interesting having these memories come up, but it's like the uniforms changed over. Yeah. Um, it was like all the Joint Chiefs of Staff didn't want to work with me, but the Air Force. That's what I remember because I wouldn't obey yeah. orders um, the way that they wanted me to. And it was, um, I remember getting somebody that was handed off to me that dealt with our clothing and food and everything we needed. And when that happened, it's like all the kids that came in after we completely transitioned, um, they all got these gray uniforms that I don't think they've brought out to the public yet. Um, but it was given to us by the Air Force and they had uniforms for kids, kid size uniforms. Well, of course <laughs> they did. They've had to. Yeah. And it was like, um, how do I explain? Like the uniforms we originally had, the ones with the tan the tan shirt and the, um, the other kind, it was, those were oversized. I remember being a kid and like having to uh, do PT, you know, physical training and then not fitting, you know? So it's like, it's weird watching the clothing transition. I remember getting in an argument with this dude and I was like, why are you sending well, me these clothes? When I was there, it was still the white cotton pajamas, like, See, like children wear in hospitals. Yep. I remember those when I came through after they, after we were brought in. What are you talking about? So um, when you said that, that, I just, I, I didn't say anything, but I do. Yeah. The white cotton pajamas and they were flannels and, and soft at least, but uh, that's what I wore the whole time until I got to Mars. And then I was given a shoulder uniform. Interesting. So, um, yeah. But clod hopper shoes. <laughs> you know, there was a guy that contacted me several years back when I when when I was talking about the clod hopper shoes that that we wore on Mars. He contacted me and he said he was a, a shoemaker in Austria. And that my description of the shoes in Shula on Mars was what made him realize that I was telling the truth. Because he made those kinds of shoes. Wow. So, but you know, it's to, weird to how a detail will will stick in somebody's mind. And that's the point that I'm making when you talk to people, you know, or when you say something, it triggers people's memories. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to the main situation. You know, I, I don't agree with a lot of people how they were like, Oh, I don't want to listen to other people's interviews or I don't want to talk to somebody else. Cause it might interfere with my testimony or this or that, you know, I can understand if you're first coming out, but it's like, I don't know. I feel like the more that you, you listen to other people that you remember, the more you, you get your memories activated. And, you know, there's other situations I think that um, Tony has talked about. Mm. where you know you you write down what you remember the first thing when you wake up because you're in between that state and you mm -hmm. can start pulling those memories out that's another thing you can do you know and write it down in a journal or whatever but now, tony's idea of a journal was wonderful except it doesn't account for alters at some point you have to start making lines for the alters Mm -hmm. because it's not you'll remember bits and pieces that are not from the same place and you have to figure out what order they came in too mm -hmm. and that, well, i mean we're getting to the time when cowboy bob is going to start joining us and uh he usually comes in a few minutes early, so I think, thank you for coming. No problem. And thank you for the audience for listening. And thank you, Daryl. Yep, yep.
Take care.